means. And so last Wednesday night, we looked at the concept of sin. We talked about what sin was. And we learned that sin means to miss the mark. Sin is anything that's unlike the character or nature of God. It's any thought, feeling, or action that we might have that that God wouldn't have or anything that we might do that God wouldn't do. So it's anything unlike God. And God's perfect. We know that, but we're not. And that's what that's how we know that we're sinners because we're not perfect and God is. God's perfect in his love and his thoughts and his motives uh, and in, in his deeds. We also discussed that uh, we not only just fall short of perfection, but like Psalm 51 5 says, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, not only uh, do we choose to sin, but also we have inherited a sinful nature. We are sinners by birth. Our very nature has a strong inclination to sin. And we're sort of drawn to sin like a pig is drawn to mud. You know, it's just in our nature to do that. The Bible teaches us that we sin because we are sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. Man, our nature is sinners. We're sinners from birth. We also learned last Wednesday night that there are four words in the Bible that are used for the word sin. And we talked about the first one was lust. And lust is the desire to do something forbidden, something against the law of God. And we know the laws of God are mentioned in the, the early books of the Old Testament. Man, there are so many laws. You ever try to read the Bible through? Man, it's hard to get through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy because of all the do's and the don'ts. And so lust is that desire to do anything that's forbidden against the law of God. We also learned another word for sin was the word trespass. Now, the word trespass is an unintentional or intentional breaking the law of God. We may not know what we're doing is wrong, or we might know what we're doing is wrong, and we do it anyway. And it's called a sin, that's called a trespass. And we actually hear that word <clears throat> in the Lord's Prayer when it says, forgive those who trespass against us. So it may be unintentional or maybe an intentional breaking of God's law. Now, the word transgression is another word that's used for sin. And what transgression is, that's a little bit stronger word. That actually means an intentional breaking of the law of God. It's something that we know that it was wrong, but we choose to do it anyway. And that would be a transgression. The other word is iniquity. Now, iniquity is the strongest word for sin because iniquity is a premeditated choice. And not only that, it's sort of like a transgression that continues without repentance. In other words, we know we've done, we're doing wrong. We know that how we're thinking, what we're doing, how we're feeling, of what we're saying, we know it's wrong. And yet we know that we shouldn't, that we should stop or maybe we should do something that God's asking us to do, but we, we're not doing it. It's continuing and it's escalating. And this continual sin, when we get to this point of iniquity, basically, our mind is becoming reprobate or depraved. We, we just, we're crossing boundaries and we're not looking back. And what's going to happen is we're about to discover the judgment of God. Now, the Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. In other words, you're going to get a consequence for your sin. It's, it's inevitable. It's a, it's, a, it's a law. Just like if I go out and sow uh, corn, then I'm going to reap corn. I'm not going to reap soybeans. So if I sow sin, then I'm going to uh, reap death. And there are three types of death I will reap because of sin. First of all, we're all going to die physically. I'm going to experience physical death. The Bible says that in Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that face the judgment. I'm also going to experience spiritual death because of sin, which is my loss of innocence. I, I, the things that I... Uh, the, I cannot go back and undo the things that I've done. I push back boundaries. And the last kind of death, that if we continue uh, on this road of sin and if we never come to a faith in Christ, then what's going to happen is we're going to experience the second death. And the second death is, is it says in, Rome, uh, excuse me, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Now here's the question. Can man be saved, or can we be saved from spiritual and eternal death? Well, maybe 
you can do more good deeds than bad and God will let you into heaven by the skin of your teeth. The problem with that is, is that God's not a scorekeeper. Oftentimes we sort of view it that way. Well, you know, I can get away with this sin. After all, God knows my heart and I do good things and I'm a good person. But the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, listen to what he's saying. He's saying if you keep the whole law, if you keep every rule and regulation, yet you just break one, then you're guilty of breaking all of it. It's sort of like a chain. If one link is broke, you're going to fall, right? And so we can't think that we're better than other people or that one or that our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds and therefore somehow we'll escape the judgment of God because of our sin. Because the Bible makes it clear that just breaking of one law breaks the whole law. Or another way we can kind of justify our sin is, is maybe we can just give uh, our heart to Jesus right before we die. You know, as we're laying on our deathbed, as we lived our life any way we wanted to, you know, at the last minute, we're going to cry out for the mercy of Jesus like the thief on the cross. Well, you might. You might be able to do that. But you have to understand you're taking a big chance. After all, you're playing Russian roulette with your soul. I don't think that most people who will die today, and there will be some that will die surprisingly, accidentally. But I think even many of those on their deathbed aren't sure that today will be the day that they die. Plus, you have to also remember that transgressions turn into iniquity. There comes a point in your life when basically your, your conscience is seared and your mind no longer thinks about God or repentance. Another way we can sort of justify ourselves is what we're doing right now, our sin right now, is that maybe we'll just stop sinning. I mean, how many times have you already made that promise? How many times have you said, I'm never going to do this again? I'm never going to act this way again. I'm never going to say anything like that again. And you try to stop, but you can't. You know, I remember a, a young, ba uh, young man telling me one time, he said, when I was a teacher, I was a young teacher, and I was in teaching in high school, and, and he was into drugs and alcohol, and I remember uh, him coming into my office one day, and he and I sit down and talk, and he said, you know, he said, Coach, one of these days, uh, I'm going to quit. He said, I'm just young right now, and I'm just playing around with it, and I'm just having a good time, but one of these days when I get older, I'm going to quit. And I told him the story. I said, you know, I said, it's like sort of driving a car down an icy road. You know, everything at first seems great. You're going so well until you try to hit the brakes. And then you suddenly you find that you can't stop. You know, that young man, I met with him uh, less than a year ago. He's now in his 40s. And the truth is, he still hasn't stopped. He's lost his family. He's lost uh, his kids. He's uh, went through a tragedy in his life. He's tried to stop, but he couldn't quit. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, no man knows how bad he is until he's tried very hard to be good. You see, when you try to be good, you realize that you can't be. When you try to stop sinning, you realize that you can't stop sinning because your very nature, uh, you're inclined to sin. So we come to a point where we're all like Paul. We've tried to quit sinning on, on our own. We've tried to better ourselves. And Paul finally comes to the conclusion in Romans chapter 7, he struggled with sin. He come to this uh, conclusion, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? from this body of death. But then Paul continues in Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, how does God deliver me through Jesus Christ our Lord? How can I be delivered from this wretched person that I am? How can I truly find the bondage breaker? How can I truly be set free and not be kept enslaved to sin. Well, it begins with the concept of confession, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You see, the process of salvation starts here. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why do we need confession? Well, first of all, God takes sin very seriously. It's anything unlike his character. When we think of sin today, we tend to water it down a bit. We call it a mistake or human error or that we simply mark it up to one of our uh, other human imperfections. But the truth scripturally is that God does not see it that way. To God, it brings with it the seeds of death. And God, by all rights, as the creator of the world, could have very simply swept the world away, destroyed it, and started all over. But God chose to provide a way that we may overcome or at least contain our sinful nature and our inclinations. Today, if you simply live in sin and rebellion, you cannot be right with God. You cannot be. For God hates sin because it destroys the lives of those he loves. For sin not only affects you spiritually, but it affects all of those around you. Every person that you influence, you indirectly touch every person in the world, like the butterfly effect. We send ripples uh, throughout the world by our actions and by what we do, be it good or be it bad. And the very reason God hates the sin, listen to me, is because he loves a sinner. The very reason God hates sin in your life is because God loves you. That is why if we want to be right with God, we must come to see sin as God sees it. we got to learn to hate it as God hates it. Even when we fall in it, even when we give in to temptation, we've got to learn to hate the very actions that we've done. And we've got to try to turn away from that. You know, if you had a child you deeply loved, and your child began to use methamphetamines or another kind of drug, uh, you would hate those drugs because the devastating effects it had on your child's life. The fellowship you have with your child will be wounded because of the warnings you give your child. God feels the same way about us when we choose to disobey him. He hates the sin because it disrupts fellowship with him and because of its effect it has on the lives of his creation. Now, what is Confession, because a lot of times we have that word confused, even those who have been going to church for many years. You see, the first step to overcoming sin is confession. Now, the Bible was originally written in Greek, and the Greek word used for confession is homologio. You see, the word confess can be broken down and, broken down and helps us understand what the word really means. The prefix homo, H-O-M-O, -O, well, we find that prefix in homogenous and homostasis and homosexual. And what that word prefix means, it means same, same. Now, the word logos or logios means word. In 1 John 1, we find the praise in the beginning was the word. And the word there is in the Greek is logos. So those two Greek words put together, homologios or homologio, those words mean, literally translated, same word. So what does the biblical confession, what does biblical confession really mean and how do we understand it? Well, it means same word. You see, the word confess means to say the same word about a subject or to, to agree completely with another about the matter. So confession with God, it means to say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin. It's to become an, uh, to an awareness that we view sin as God views it, uh, views it, and we agree with God that it is sin that it is wrong, that it separates us from God, and it separates us from one another. So what is biblical confession? Well, first of all, let's find out what biblical confession is not. <clears throat> confession is more than simply admitting that you have sinned. Now, some people uh, may think they can go to a priest or to a friend and simply admit they've sinned. In other words, they simply name what they have done. But confession is much more than admitting you did something wrong. I'll give you an illustration of that. I wonder how many of you out there listening to me have ever stolen anything. 
Uh, maybe you've stolen a nickel from your mama's dresser, or maybe you picked up something that wasn't yours, or maybe you cheated on a test. If you did, raise your hand if you ever cheated. Or maybe there's some of you out there that's ever told a lie. Maybe it's a little white lie that kept you out of trouble. Now, I would think that most of us here would say that, well, yes, that's true. I've stolen something small or I've told a little white lie. Then I guess we could say everyone that's listening to me are nothing more than liars and thieves. Now, when I say it that way or put it that way, I've got you to admit sin but immediately we begin to justify our actions in our mind by saying, well, everyone's stolen something or has told a little white lie. But we must understand what just happened. I got you to admit that you had sinned, but this is in no way true confession. So confession is more than admitting that you have sinned. Confession is also not simply uh, feeling sorry for your sin. I remember uh, one time when I was a child and I was the oldest brother. I was the older brother. I had two uh, younger brothers. And uh, the middle brother was out in a sandbox and he had built this uh, sand castle or he was building this sand castle. So I decided as the older brother, I was going to go out there and give him some help, you know. And uh, so I went out there and I was trying to tell him what to do, like uh, older brothers, you know, should do, you know, give the advice to the younger brother. Well, he, for some reason, stupidly, he did not want my advice. And so it made me mad. And so just out of anger, I just finally just stepped all over his sandcastle that he was creating, you know, and just messed the whole thing up. Well, what happened was as soon as I did that, he screamed and started crying. Well, when he screamed and started crying, mama heard him inside the house and so here she comes outside the house and she finds out what i've done well she starts to try to spank me now i don't know how many of you deal with spanking if you know what that uh, entails nowadays but it, it wasn't fun and as she began to try to spank me i began to try to run away from her and i began to scream over and over again mama i'm so sorry i'm so sorry and uh, I, I never quit saying I was sorry until the spanking was over. You see, the truth of the matter is, was I really sorry about tearing up my brother's sandcastle? Or was I sorry I got called? You see, most of us don't really feel sorrow and grief over sin. Rather, we're sorry we got called. Or we're sorry we have to pay the consequence for our actions. Thieves, liars, cheaters, and addicts often admit they're sorrowful after they've been called. But as soon as the dust settles, stealing, lying, cheating, and using again. Confession means to agree with God. It's a godly sorrow. It's a godly sorrow that comes to us only when we see our sin as God sees it. And you cannot come to this point on your own. You cannot agree with God and see your sin as God sees it simply through uh, on your own. There has to be a revelation. And that revelation has to come from the Holy Spirit of God. You see, only God can bring us to the point of true confession. That's why salvation is a gift of God. There's nothing we can do, even on our own, in our own sinful nature. God has to break through. And many times God breaks us. And, and we understand that we are guilty of sin and we begin to understand as the Holy Spirit reveals it to us that our sin breaks God's heart and others. It is at this point that we see we've been personally in rebellion against God. And if we ever claim that we loved him while we were living in our sin, it was nothing more than simple lip service. We've heard people admit they sin, and then they talk about a, a drunken and for, fornicating lifestyle with pride. They talk about all the people they've been with sexually, or they brag about how much liquor or drugs they can use. But biblical confession may begin when you hear a sermon that steps on your toes, or maybe you read a scripture that reminds you of your wrongdoing. 
Or maybe you see a Christian who's living in victory and somehow God convicts you. Or maybe God has allowed you enough pain from the choices that you've made uh, with your sin that you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And at that moment, God breaks through and he suddenly reveals to us our sinfulness. Salvation begins with brokenness. Brokenness. We are convicted by the Holy Spirit. And we realize that we are sinning. And because of that, we are separating ourselves from God and we're hurting ourselves, destroying our own lives and the lives of others. And we realize that not only are what we're doing is wrong, but that we are wrong. And we become deeply ashamed of our thoughts and actions. As I said, salvation begins in brokenness. And suddenly, we see sin in a different light. We're now beginning to see our sinfulness through the eyes of God and coming to agree with him and what we have done and who we are. We are unlike God. We are unlike the character of God. And God wants us to take sin very seriously. So what are we to confess? Well, first of all, we are to agree with God that we are sinners. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. God knows that we are sinful creatures with sinful inclinations, but we must realize it. We must come to the understanding that our sinful nature tempts us to actions that hurts God, hurts ourselves, and hurts others within our sphere of influence. We must come to see our need for forgiveness and our need for help. We must come to the point of realizing that we cannot do it by our own strength, that we cannot have victory over our sinful nature on our own. We cannot quit our sin. We cannot live a, a life uh, out of bondage by sheer willpower. We need help. And the first step on the road to forgiveness, victory, and peace is to realize that we cannot do it on our own that we need God to give us strength to overcome our sinful nature. We cannot do it alone. We need the help of God. And here's the point we surrender and let Jesus have control where we say, God, I cannot do it on my own. God, I am a sinner. God, please help me. I can't stop doing what I'm doing. And we surrender control of our lives over to God. Which brings us to the second thing we must confess. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 verse 9, If thou wilt shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Before we lived, before confession, we lived our lives unashamed of our sin. We did what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. If we truly want help in overcoming our sins, it begins with a confession that Jesus is Lord of our lives. We're commanded by God to be constantly confessing Jesus as my, me, mine, individual Lord. Of course, we all recognize he's a rightful Lord of the universe. Yes, he's the creator of all things, but here's the question for you today. Is he your Lord? You see, we got to realize the word Lord, what it actually means, because it's not a word we use today. But the word Lord, it means boss, king, ruler, chief. You have to come to a point in your lives that you agree with God, not only that you're a sinner and that you cannot overcome this sin on your own, but you also have to agree with God that Jesus is Lord. He's now your boss your master, the ruler of your life and heart, and you are now striving to be obedient to him. The confession that Jesus is Lord does not simply, uh, does not simply mean that you believe that Jesus is God's son. It's, it means that you, he is now the boss of your life, and you are trying to live a life that's pleasing to him. When there were people following Jesus around and that when he was physically living on earth, there were many who followed him. At one time, we know over 5,000 were sitting there listening to his sermons. And that just included men, not including women and children. 
It was at a point like this when this huge crowd was following Jesus that Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I wonder how many of us today call Jesus Lord, but yet we don't do what, what he says. We call him Lord and say, Lord, help me. But we're not willing to do what Jesus says we need to do to get that help. Not only that, but we need to confess our individual sin. In Acts chapter 19, verse 18, it tells a story of a church and how that they were in sin. And it says, many who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. We're not simply to confess that we are sinners, but we are to name our sin, especially if it's a known sin. We are to continually confess our sin. Each individual sin hurts God because he knows that every sin carries with it seeds that will bring harm to us, and if left unabated, eventually will destroy our lives and the lives of others. God wants you to have life of joy and peace. He intended for life to be lived beyond the mundane, and life live not in bondage to habits and hang-ups. He wants for you more than simple existence. You see, God wants the best for you, and he knows that sin creates in you an appetite for more sin. No alcoholic or prostitute or unwed father or mother ever dreamed of becoming what they become when they were children and innocent. No child, uh, young child is out there saying, you know, when I grow up, I can't wait to be divorced or an alcoholic or a drug addict. But what happened? How did you get to that point? How did we get to that point? Well, it happened slowly with one small sin leading to a greater desire for another sin. You see, the first step to stopping the vicious cycle of reoccurring sin is confession of that in individual sin. When we realize what we are doing is truly wrong and we feel the conviction, at this point we should confess the act and thought or deed to God as sin. One of the great real evidences of true confession is that we have a true, deep, heartfelt desire never to do the deed again. Now, it doesn't mean that we'll always be perfect, but it means that we're trying to be. We're striving to be. We're striving to be better every day. We have come to see that the sin committed, that sin, that one sin would have nailed Jesus to the cross if that was the only sin ever committed. We're to strive with all our lives and hearts not to break the heart of God, not to sin. But when we do sin, we're to confess that sin, see it as God sees it, and ask God for his grace and strength not to commit that sin again. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you right now? Maybe you're feeling guilty. Maybe you're feeling ashamed of what you're doing how you're living, you know you're a hypocrite and you're putting on a face. Maybe you're pretending you have it all together, but when your head hits the pillow at night and the darkness of that room surrounds you, you're miserable. Maybe today you crave to say, as the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Do you feel empty? Are you trapped in depression, a habit, an addiction? Maybe you feel your bones are wasting away through groaning all day long. 
You're miserable, searching in all the wrong places for love and happiness that can only be found when you find peace with God. This all begins with confession, seeing the sin the way God sees it and agreeing with him that the sin is killing you. It's destroying your life and destroying your relationships with God and with others. Because of, if you confess your transgressions to the Lord, there's a promise from God. Listen to that promise. He will forgive you the guilt of your sin. If we confess our sins, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It always begins in brokenness, but it can end in a fresh start, a new day dawning in your life. It's time to get serious about your life. It's time to get serious about your sin. And it's time to get serious about your relationship with God. You know, maybe this coronavirus was sent by God. Maybe. Or at least it was allowed by God. Maybe it was a time that we could truly find out what our real priorities in life are. Maybe it was for us, for a time to look as a nation and go, no matter how smart the doctors are or how powerful the governments are, there's things that are beyond our control. Maybe this is a time of spiritual awakening, or can be, that we look for something beyond what we can see. I hope that's true for you. I hope that you are now looking for a deeper walk with God because God's waiting. He's waiting. You see, God hates the sin because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he was willing to go to a cross and die to you to demonstrate that love for you. I love the verse. For God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Put your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, that if you believe in him, put your faith and trust in him, you will have eternal life. And eternal life doesn't mean life in heaven. It means Zoe life, spiritual life life full and free here and now. Let me begin or let me end by praying for you right now. Lord Jesus, I, I just thank you, God, that you love us. Father, you don't have to, but your very nature is that. And God, even though we're sinners, Father, you demonstrate your love for us by constantly giving us grace. And your word says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance, but oftentimes it doesn't, does it, God? Because sometimes we just forget that goodness and neglect it and continue our own way. And then, Father, you break us. And at the moment our pain hits us, Father, I pray that, that God, we just turn our heads towards you, that we tilt our head a different direction and realize that, God, you can give us a new lease on life. Father, I pray for everyone that hears this message, whether it's on Facebook Live now or God later. I pray that, God, you would use the Holy Spirit to convict us, to break them, Lord Jesus, and to turn their face towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. This Wednesday night, we'll continue with our study of, on concepts as one concept builds upon the other. I hope you join us. We'll begin at 7 o'clock. If God's willing, we'll be here. You have a great week. Keep safe. And if you need anything, my email, you can contact me here on Facebook. My email's on Facebook. My phone number's on Facebook. Uh, feel free to contact me. Call me. Check on me. I'll check on you. And let's just keep each other uh, safe and let each other know that Jesus loves them. And so does someone else. Thank you for watching. God bless.